not. Uh, well, I have it in my office. So just put it down. And then, actually, do you mind just putting your name on that page too, just to be on the safe side? All right, so yeah, if you haven't turned in your exam yet, please go ahead and do that. There's just a pile up front. I will probably get to grading those over the weekend. That's usually when I have time to just like chill and I have a system where I like there's a couch and my cat comes and lays on the ones I've graded and it's a whole thing. Um, so that'll probably happen this weekend, but if I have time, I'll try to do them tomorrow afternoon. I know y'all are probably eager. So what do you think? Was it helpful to have that as a take home rather than do it in class? Awesome. I've seen lots of nods. Again, it's my grand experiment this year. So I appreciate you all being a little bit of my guinea pigs. Um, so the next exam will be the same amount of material, three chapters. And then the last exam will be four chapters, but you're going to have a lot more time to do the last one. So the last one is a Monday to Monday, just based on how the exam schedule works. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about today, but probably um, Friday, we'll take some time and we'll talk about your infographic project a little more in detail because coming up uh a week from friday you have your topic due for that on blackboard so um we'll spend some time actually chatting about that on friday all right so i'm gonna go ahead and get the captions on help out a little bit all right and so for this we're going to do gender and sex and sexuality and um there's this, I mean, we literally teach a whole class on this. I mean, that's true of a lot of these chapters. So know that this is a very like surface level overview of these topics, like the other chapters. Folks who just came in, if you want to come on up and turn in your exams after you get settled, feel free. So they're not burning a hole in your pocket the whole class. I know that feeling. Um, <laughs> so if this topic ends up really interesting you, uh, we do offer a whole class on psych of gender. And then if you're really into it, uh, consider classes in the gender, women's and sexuality studies program because there, there's a whole field dedicated to this. So, all right. And I'm gonna take attendance by who turned in their exam, although I know a couple of people turned them in to me early. So I've got two down already, um, but the folks who are on Zoom, I'm just making sure I get them checked in. All right. So we're going to start with some basic definitions. And just know moving forward that um, some of what we talk about, the language is evolving, right? So even the language that's in your textbook might not be completely up to date. So I will try to update y'all as we go through, um, if there are any changes to terminology or if there are any alternatives to terminology that's used. Um, but this is something where I myself <laughs> am constantly learning new terms, constantly learning the correct definitions for terms. And again, like I teach in our gender, women's and sexuality studies uh, classes. So it's just an evolving field. Um, so no worries if you get confused about the language because you're probably not the only one. All right, so we're going to start by defining sex. And one thing I'll say going into this is just biological sex is a lot more complex than we think it is. So we tend to think of it in terms of properties that determine whether you're male or female. And it's like most people are like, oh, it should be pretty obvious. You've got your 23 pair of chromosomes, you're either XX. If you're female, XY, if you're male, boom, that's it. Well, it's actually a lot more complex than that. 
Um, there are people who are XXY. There are people who are X and like don't have a second 23rd chromosome. Uh, and so there are permeations even within genetics of sex. Um, and so a lot of this will go into discourse that you'll hear that people are like, men are men and women are women. There are a lot of natural variations in that. And even things like, we're gonna talk about uh, the genitalia, things along those lines. The same percent of people are born intersex, which means you can't really tell which sex they are by their external genitalia or they have both, um, as there are redheads in the world. So like redheads aren't super common, but we know they exist, right? It's the same thing for people who are intersex. And so it's important to keep that in mind that like a lot of the conceptions we have about just, it's just you're a boy or a girl, right? Um, biologically aren't accurate. <laughs> so that's, again, confusing, but true. So your gonads, in theory, you have either ovaries or testes. Again, some people might have both. Some people might have internal organs that you're not really sure what they are. Um, and again, these are rare, but not as rare as we think, right? We also think about gonadal hormones. So thinking about estrogens or androgens. So we tend to think like, oh, women have estrogens, men have androgens. Any one of any biological sex, any gender actually has both in their systems, right? It's just sort of like the balance of it uh, that relates. So I don't know if uh, folks, androgens include things like testosterone, that's sort of the more common term. Um, I don't know if folks have heard of Castor Cell Monoia. Um, so she is a track star um, and she was so good, they had to gender test her. Um, and this is something they've done at the Olympics for at least a hundred years. Um, and they found out that she has abnormally high levels of testosterone. And so there was like talk of like, does that disqualify her? Until they tested her, she didn't know that, right? It's just her body. Um, and there've been other cases where people are XXY when that happens. And it's like, they don't know that you don't, it's not like routine when you're born that they're like, we're gonna run a total genetic profile and see if you happen to have a weird thing going on with your sex genes, right? Um, and so people will get excluded from their sports or at least questioned based on things that are completely out of their control. And again, largely they don't know about. Um, yeah, so fun fact, obviously in the early 1900s at the Olympics, they did not have the ability to test your DNA. And so what they used to do is have all the female athletes stripped down naked and parade in front of a panel of male judges to prove they were women. Yeah, super messed up, right? <laughs> uh, so yes, it was something that we've always been like really concerned about. And, and people are arguing it's because of fairness, what have you, but again, like, these people aren't trying to cheat or pull one over, right? They just don't know. Internal reproductive structures are another component of this. So, uh, you know, do you have a uterus or do you have a vas deferens and all of the male systems? Or do you, again, have some sort of mix? External genitalia, as I mentioned in passing a couple of minutes ago, can be more vague than we think. We think, oh, it's either a penis or a, a vulva, right? Well, there are some people who have a penis of the length where it's like, is that a penis or is that a big clitoris, right? And so when intersex children are born or children with unclear genitalia are born, oftentimes the doctors almost arbitrarily decide at that point in time. And in a lot of cases, those children are put through surgical procedures uh, very early on. So if you have a large clitoris that they're going to assign you female, right? They might give you surgery to 
reduce the size of that clitoris when you're an infant. This is why it kind of like cracks those of us in medicine and psychology up when people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that new surgery is on people's genitalia. It's like, they're doing it without people's permission when they're born, right, in some cases. So again, a little more complicated. Then you have your secondary sex characteristics, and these are things that tend to come out of puberty. So breasts, uh, facial hair, a lot of the things along those lines, even things like vocal changes, right? Um, now that I'm masking full time and I have these lecture classes, sometimes I sound like I'm going through puberty, right? Like I'll get little voice cracks because I'm not drinking water. Um, so those are all things that we use as sort of mental shortcuts to identify someone as male or female, but sometimes those are vague too, right? Some men have things that look like they could be a breast or a chest and same thing for women. Some women are very naturally flat, right? Um, some women who, you know, again, maybe there's some hormonal imbalances, but they don't know, will have more noticeable facial hair, right? And so some women wax any facial hair to sort of be uh, aware of this. And some women feel the need to because their facial hair is really noticeable. And so again, these are things that we think of, oh yeah, you're just one or the other. But in fact, there's a lot more gray area than we think. And like, side note to this, it's not just humans, right? The animal world is the same way. So uh, it's gonna like ruin some of your childhood. So I apologize in advance. Uh, finding Nemo, right? So Finding Nemo, his mom was killed, right? And he's left with his dad. Well, IRL in real life, uh, Nemo's dad would have changed sex to be female. Uh, yeah, because cloudfish could actually change their sex. Actually, there's a decent number of fish that can change their sex uh, to sort of become what is needed in their environment, or sometimes it's to become the dominant uh, member of their school or what have you. Also, maybe not surprisingly, the platypus, super weird. We know the platypus is super weird anyway, right? I believe the platypus has 40 different variations of biological sex. Right, so again, even in nature, it's not your one or the other. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and also, so one of the things you'll often say, and I'm gonna say something similar in a minute, is you'll hear like, sex is determined biologically, gender's determined socially. We also have social ideas about what it means if you have certain biological characteristics, right? Um, and so like that even gets contaminated a little bit. So as I mentioned, we tend to think of gender as the social and psychological aspects of being female or male or um, another gender identity. So a lot of folks now are uh, identifying as non-binary. They just don't feel like female or male fit them. And there really is a spectrum of gender identity. And again, I like to be fully transparent with y'all. You know, I remember research about this first coming out in the 90s when I was in high school. And I was skeptical. I was like, what do you mean there's this rainbow of gender, right? <laughs> but, you know, you grow, you mature, you get a lot more knowledge, right? And so um, now I definitely understand that, you know, those identities, particularly as they're prescribed by society, don't always apply to everyone. Another important note is the idea of binary gender, male, female that's it, is a very colonial concept. So the vast majority of indigenous peoples here in the US, but also worldwide, had conceptualizations of a third gender or gender fluidity. Um, so you'll sometimes hear the word two spirits to describe this, although each uh, nation uh, would have their own terminology and their own language. So the idea that like just gender fluidity is, is brand new is kind of funny to indigenous peoples because they're like, no, this is like the thing we had. And then the European settlers came over and they said, no, that's 
that's sacrilegious, that's not a thing, we can't recognize that. And in fact, we might murder you if you don't conform to our norms, right? So that's something important to keep in mind is that a lot of our conceptualizations come from what I would argue was a sort of fundamentalist twisted take on Christianity's interpretation of these things, right? That was brought over by these settlers. So, but we do think about gender identity in terms of masculinity, femininity, or androgyny. And androgyny we tend to think of as both. Um, and now again, we tend to more use gender fluidity rather than androgyny, but androgyny kind of pulls up uh, thoughts of like David Bowie, right? This sort of like between masculine and feminine. Masculinity in our society is associated with instrumentality or agentic. Um, so we, we associate masculinity with doing things. And we go out, you're going to be the one who, you know, makes the bacon, does things. And we associate femininity with expressiveness and also subjectivity. The idea that women are more likely to be the, the people that we see depicted as objects in ads. We'll look at some fun ads. We probably won't get to them until Wednesday, but I've got some fun, fun ads for us to look at. Some from the 50s. You can imagine how you know great the gender roles are in those, right? But then some modern ones that aren't much better. Um, so women are often sort of thought more as like to be seen uh, rather than being doers. And you can imagine all sorts of psychological issues if you're internalizing that. Similarly, there's all kinds of psychological issues for men who internalize like, I have to be doing, it's not okay for me to show emotions, right? There's some psychological research, research suggesting things like mass shooters, which are majority male, right? Uh, might represent, at least in part, no, having no other socially acceptable way to express their emotions, right? Not that it makes it okay and not that it justifies their actions because clearly there are plenty of other men who don't do those things, right? Um, but it is a mental health crisis for men in our society. So how do we develop uh, these sexual no, identifiers, I guess? Uh, <laughs> characteristics perhaps. So we know, interestingly, and if you've again, taken intro or taken like, or taken a one-on-one where you cover development or you've taken a, like a lifespan development class, you've probably heard this before, but all embryos, so a quick review of prenatal development. So you start out as a zygote, which is just kind of like, a few cells, right? And then you become an embryo. And then it actually takes a while before you're developed enough to be labeled a fetus, right? So all embryos are actually female. And then there's a point in development where essentially there's like a wash of androgens. And if there is a Y chromosome in the embryo and uh, that makes that embryo male. So again, even the development of uh, sex, right, is not black and white. So if you have the SRY gene, then you're going to develop testes and androgens and that male physiology. Again, with the exposure to those hormones in utero. But again, female is the default condition for our species. Now, are there gender differences in regards to the brain? A lot of people have tried to argue yes. A lot of people have tried to argue not only yes, but these are really important. Um, and what happens when you look at things on the larger scales, they often tend to wash out, right? So your book will probably talk about oh yeah, there are these gender differences or sex differences. And some of them are like size of brain parts or function of brain parts, corresponding cognitive function, which part of the brain is involved in particular behaviors. 
here's sort of the mind boggling thing about biology. Our biology is always going to be influenced by what goes on around us, right? So our environment can actually influence our brain. And that is true from very early on. And some even suggest it's true in utero. And certainly we know in some cases it's very true in utero. So for example, something like fetal alcohol syndrome, right? If the mother drinks excessively and heavily, that's going to affect the development of the fetus and they're gonna come out with certain physical characteristics they would not have had otherwise. Similarly, um, fetuses can hear sounds and they can pick up on certain things. Um, and so that actually influences your brain development in utero as well. So uh, I think I have a slide about her later, uh, but there's a great epidemiologist. So if you're not familiar with that term, epidemiologists study disease usually. They study patterns in large samples. Um, and she, her name is Rebecca Jordan Young, and she took all the studies about these brain differences and put them together like you would an epidemiological study and used that methodology. And what she found is that basically when you look at these on larger scales, you don't find differences. And that might seem kind of weird because you're like, well, but if you're finding them in these smaller samples, why would that not replicate out? Part of what happens when you're studying the brain in particular is that you need a lot of money to do it. So when you're doing something like a MRI, a CT, to get pictures of the brain, you as a researcher essentially have to pay for that time like someone's insurance would uh, within the machine. So these are actually very expensive studies to do. And for that reason, their sample sizes are often very small. So, you know, typically in a psych study, like a treatment study, we're looking for at least like 50, 60 people. One of these brain scan studies, like 20 might be a good sample size. Well, if you've only got 20 people, you know, and they're all from the same area typically because you're recruiting them to come in. You have a whole host of factors that can kind of mess with things as a result of that. There we go. All right. So we have different ways of trying to explain sex and gender differences, particularly in behavior, if we're thinking about this from a psychological perspective. So biological accounts argue that there are these behavioral differences, even in newborns and infants. But like I just said, we know that these <laughs> infants are fetuses before they're infants and they're influenced in utero. We also know that as soon as someone is born, typically what's the first thing they say? it's a boy, it's a girl, right? And they wrap them in a pink blanket or they wrap them in a blue blanket. And then there are really interesting studies they've done where they show people a picture of a baby crying. And they say, okay, what's, why is this girl baby crying? It's, oh, she's sad. Then they show another group of people. Why is this boy baby crying? Oh, he's angry. It's the same picture of the same baby, right? But just be told, that their sex is something in particular, people interpret things differently. And so, yeah, there's gonna be different behavior because they're treated differently from before birth. This is actually one of the main reasons why my husband and I decided not to find out the sex of our baby until she was born, because we wanted to kind of start off on the right foot um, and not have preconceived notions. Funny sign that I was convinced she was a boy, but uh, when they held her up and I was like, oh, nope, not a boy. Okay, uh, <laughs> good to know. It's just a lot of people use he as a gender neutral pronoun, uh, which is problematic in and of itself. And so at the end, everyone was like, well, you know, when he comes out, so I was like, oh, well, I'm having a boy, okay. Um, but yeah, and so those things obviously influence it. Evolutionary accounts, and I'm sorry, this I was going through a uh, Google Slides actually changes how my slides look and uh, makes them sometimes hard to read. Um, so let me, I was trying to go through and fix them this morning and this one obviously didn't fix that well. 
um, and I'll fix this one too. Uh, Okay, just trying to make it a little more legible for y'all. <laughs> so your eyes aren't bleeding, trying to figure stuff out. There we go. Yeah, this looks totally different in PowerPoint. Okay, so evolutionary accounts. Interestingly, so when we think about evolutionary ideas in psychology, we're taking biological principles and trying to apply them to behavior. And so we're trying to say, why are generalized behaviors that most people do, why do those occur? Right, and some of the problem there then becomes, well, especially with behavior, sometimes there's more individual differences than similarities, right? Like everyone in this room would act a little different in given scenarios, right? Just because of who you are. But that being said, the way evolutionary theory tries to explain these differences is through that there might have been selection pressures for these gendered behaviors that we think of it in terms of um, survival of the fittest, right? That people who had certain traits were more likely to be selected as mates and therefore reproduce and therefore pass down their genes. Fun side note, um, Darwin didn't actually coin or use that term survival of the fittest in that way. It was his husband, it was not his husband, geez, that would be a different thing. His cousin, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's like the TARDIS went back and messed with things. Um, <laughs> his cousin, Galton, who was a eugenicist, came up with the idea of survival of the fittest, applying to humans. Um, but anyway, <laughs> the idea here is that there would be competitions for mates, usually by males. And again, if we take from the animal kingdom, this makes sense. And uh, if we look at like birds of paradise that have these elaborate feathers and displays, right? To try to attract the mate, uh, things along those lines. But then you have preferences or choices for quality mates, usually by the female of the species, like they get to be picky not always the case. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking about duck biology. I don't know how many people think that know about duck reproduction. It's sort of horrifying. Um, essentially, female ducks a lot of times are not consenting in any way uh, to reproduction. And as a result, they actually have uh, false vaginas sometimes so that the male duck won't actually impregnate them. Really interesting. Uh, and then there's reproductive challenges of, do you want to produce a few quality offspring that you could put a lot of time and resources into? Or is it all about quantity? You're gonna just try to produce a lot of offspring and see if they survive, right? And we think of this more in the animal world, but certainly there are these different thoughts and people too, right? A lot of us probably came from families where there's just a few kids or maybe you're an only child, but then you have folks like the Duggars, right? Who have 19 kids. Uh, and again, they're both perfectly acceptable reproductive strategies, but just, I don't think either side would really understand the other necessarily, right? Um, in the animal world, uh, quantity is sometimes absurd, right? So like fish will produce thousands of eggs in the hope that like a few will survive basically um and sometimes uh things are more messed up than we think too has anyone ever had like a hamster or a gerbil growing up did any of them ever have pups <laughs> yeah so um my mom was a teacher in my elementary school growing up and her classroom had two gerbils and they had pups and we discovered, unfortunately, through that, that um, the parents will actually eat the pups. Uh, and it's partially because of resources available, um, but also sort of like a weeding out, essentially. Yeah, sure. It's something similar. The mom doesn't eat them, but like, so like, like, I don't know if it's specifically like that, but like, the mom doesn't eat them, but like, for example, 
I think it's the, I don't think it's those that eat their litter mates or whatever. I think it's the ones that are like kept inside. Yeah, so and sharks like the first really one born to like Yes, yes. So sharks can reproduce in several different ways. The egg laying, like you said, a lot of times other like dogfish or other smaller sharks. Some will uh, gestate, essentially like produce the eggs inside and they hatch in utero. And yeah, exactly what Abby was just saying. The first one, the largest one, will eat all their siblings in utero to like come out strong, basically. Yeah. And so it's like a different version of survival of the fittest, right? Yeah, yeah. The animal kingdom in general be wild. And that's why it always cracks me up when people are like, oh, you know, the maternal instinct, just like in the wild. And I'm like, dude, hamster feet are a baby. It's like, not always true, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, obviously, <laughs> you know, in humans, again, this is going to be different. More and more, we have people now who are choosing what we call voluntary childlessness. They just say, look, the world sucks right now, or I don't want to have kids, or economically it's not feasible for me, right? And so they don't um, have kids, and that doesn't really fit into this evolutionary account, right? Neither do same-sex couples, per se, or, you know, people that have infertility issues, things along those lines. Again, somehow this got more screwed up than anything else. Give me just a sec. I'm just try real hard not to make your eyes bleed this early in the morning. So we're gonna work on this real quick. There we go. I know, right? <laughs> this is actually reminding me of it, it turned out being okay. But um one time I had a student come to observe my theories of personality class. We were talking about this topic, and we talk about this topic and theories of personality. We like really dig in. And um, we were talking about, you know, there's like a activity we do where it's like, well, if you had two kids and they both fell over on the side of the boat, like, which one would you say? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, this child is like never going to want to come here. And she came up after she was like, that was so interesting. And she came here and she made her decide. So I felt a little better, but, you know, sometimes I worry about traumatizing people. <laughs> All right. Other theories, social cognitive theories. And again, I made this worse. Oh, well, we'll roll with it. Uh, so this argues that our, our society, our parents, the media, all that stuff we're steeped in day after day, that is going to influence our sense of gender, right? How we see other people acting, what we're told, things like, man up, right? Or a lady doesn't do that, right? Things along those lines. So this is part of socialization that we might get rewarded or punished for behaviors that are gender non-conforming. The most extreme version of this, sadly, is um, the fact that a lot of kiddos who come out to their families as trans and their families very conservative, uh, get kicked out of the house. So actually, coming out to your non-supportive family is the leading reason for homelessness among youth. Not just LGBTQ plus youth, but like youth in general. Um, so obviously, you know, there's a big punishment, right? And rewards can be as subtle as, oh my gosh, you look so pretty in that, right? Uh, oh, you're so cute. You know, one of the things I really try to say to my daughter is like, you're so strong. And she'd be like, yeah, I'm strong like Louisa. If anyone's seen Encanto, like she loves that, right? Um, but that's hard. It's interesting. A bunch of my fellow GWSS faculty and I had babies within a few years of each other. We all had girls. And we talked about how much we have to mentally check because we're so socialized, not just be like, you're so cute, right? So be like, you're so strong. And then <laughs> one of my friends is like, yes. And I told her like, you're so, she's using like SAT words. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know that we need to go there, right? But <laughs> it's really hard to fight against this socialization. Even if you yourself are choosing to try to be a um, informed, 
parents that is trying not to put this on your kiddos. Um, and then gender schema theory looks at the mental framework that we, as humans, our brains try to make shortcuts for us. Our brains try to make things as quickly as possible for us to process. And oftentimes these schemas are pretty harmless, right? So like when kids first start learning about animals, like everything with four legs and fur is a doggy, right? A horse is a big doggy, a zebra is a striped doggy, right? A giraffe is a long neck doggy. Um, a lion is a cat doggy, right? <laughs> it just sort of goes that. And I eventually learned this is what a dog is, this is what a cat is. This is what an equine is, right? Uh, and with gender, we get the same thing. This is how a woman acts. This is how a man acts. And so when people don't fit that schema, it can be difficult for us to parse. And it can also be difficult for us to step outside of that, even if the schema itself feels oppressive to us. Social role theory looks in particular at the division of labor. So there's this idea that any sort of sexual gender differences in how we behave is natural or biological, right? Um, and again, if we go to the animal kingdom, we know that it's not always the female who cares for the young. In fact, in some cases, like the fish who are laying a bunch of eggs, neither parent cares for the young. They just kind of let them go and hope for the best, right? Um, but even things like seahorses, right? The male is actually the one who carries the eggs. Uh, jawfish, it's the same way. Jawfish, well, the male will actually hold the eggs in their mouth um, and it has to aerate them like every few seconds for weeks. So the male is not eating for weeks while he does this. Penguins, they share responsibility with these things, right? So it's not natural or biological necessarily, but we humans like to pretend a lot of things are, right? Um, and so those become value differences or expected differences. You are supposed to act this way. If you don't, again, there's some sort of punishment involved with it, whether it's ostracization, unfortunately in some households, physical abuse, things along those lines. Uh, I don't, did anyone watch the Hulu series Under the Banner of Heaven? So Andrew Garfield stars in it, and it's a real life case, although they've made up some of the characters of um, a fundamentalist Mormon sect. And again, people who are fundamentalists of any religion are more like each other than they are. They're people of their own religion. So I just want to put that out there that like, this is not true of all Mormons. Um, but there was a woman who wanted a career and they thought was like unduly influencing their wives and so they actually murdered her. Um, and, you know, there's a extreme version, right? Uh, but typically it is shunning, uh, a lot of talk of like, you should be doing this instead. So this is a lot of where we get our gender role ideas, but also gender stereotypes. Oh, Men can't do that. That's girly, that's sissy, right? Women can't do that. That's not appropriate. Uh, and this can kind of come to fruition in a lot of weird ways, actually. Uh, so for example, even though men are often discouraged from going into fields of nursing, say, because that's seen as a feminine field, um, once they get in there, they often are promoted at a higher rate because they're men and so they should be in leadership roles. So it can actually be hard for male nurses who like wanna be on the floor with patients to kind of stay in that position. Women face the opposite, you know, when they get into CEO roles, oh, they can't handle it, blah, 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 blah. All right, so we've been talking about sex and gender, but there's a third concept that's related here that we talk about a lot as well. And that's sexual orientation. So we tend to think about this in terms of their sexual behavior, their erotic interests, um, and it's, it's more than just that, right? So we know that, for example, you can be romantically interested in someone, but not sexually. Again, regardless of your sexual orientation, uh, we know that this isn't always clear cut. 
And so the traditional stats have been that people who are straight or heterosexual, about 90% of the population, we're kind of revising that now because we're actually getting to a society where people feel more comfortable expressing if they're not straight, right? Uh, so we're seeing different numbers there. And as you can see, like there's only three terms here for sexuality. And in fact, we know that there are more than these, right? Uh, homosexual, oftentimes we tend to use gay or lesbian now as our terminology, right? Uh, or even queer. So queer is a really interesting term. That is a term that used to be vilified. It was used as a slur against people who were LGBTQ+. Uh, but they've sort of reclaimed it. And so now a lot of people see it as sort of like a banner. A lot of folks, regardless of, of sort of not marginalized, I think it's a good word, marginalized sexual orientations feel comfortable using this banner of queer. Um, but you'll, you won't often hear people use homosexual in this way anymore. Um, and then bisexuality, so having uh, attraction to both genders, or some people will say bisexuality is also inclusive of being attracted to anyone of any gender. Um, I've had debate about that with my students, who some believe one, some believe in other. So again, this language is fluid and evolving. Um, but you also have things like pansexuality, which is more encompassing than bisexuality. You have asexuality. So there are some people who are just not interested in sexual relationships, right? Uh, we actually had one of our professors last year give a talk about where have all the aces gone? And the fact that like, sometimes that's the most stigmatized of the sexuality because people are like, how could you not be interested in sex? Well, some people just aren't, right? Um, and again, a whole sort of rainbow of interpretation. And again, that's one of the reasons why the rainbow is used to represent these folks uh, beyond just these three things. And some people don't even like labels, right? Some will argue just like their gender fluid, that their sexuality is also fluid. Um, I've actually done some research with folks who are members of the LGBTQ plus community. And I always like, I give them a two prong question to identify their sexuality. I say, if you had to choose one of these labels, which would you use for yourself? And I list the traditional labels. And then I'm like, what would you actually describe your sexuality as? And I've had people write things like, I'm just attracted to the person. Like it doesn't matter their sex, their gender, whatever. It's like the person or their soul that I'm attracted to. Um, and so those people don't like to put labels on it. This is a misconception I think that's out there a lot. And we have psychological studies that, that uh, disprove these misconceptions. So your sexual orientation is not influenced by being raised by a gay parent. So this is um, unfortunately something we've seen in some states where they try to say that, uh, say lesbian couples can't adopt children uh, because, you know, again, they're going to somehow corrupt these kids, right? The vast majority of people who come out as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, so, oh, sorry, I keep using that acronym. So that is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, Q is for queer or questioning. And then the plus is like making sure we include everybody who doesn't identify with those labels. Uh, but the majority of people who come out were reared by straight parents, right? And so that necessarily isn't going to influence it in the way we think we are. Some people have argued like, oh, if you're too gentle as a parent or you're too strict as a parent, that's going to influence your child being gay or not. No, nope. <laughs> right? And again, tons of research supporting that we don't see that. It's that zero correlation diagram we looked at, right? Where the dots are just kind of all over the place. Uh, childhood sexual experimental experimentation. Kids are going to play doctor with the kid next door, right? Uh, kids masturbate, even though they don't know that's what they're doing, right? So um, growing up, well, not growing up, I guess it was like a college, but I would help at my mom's school and I would sub and uh, she taught some preschoolers and at nap time, they'd have to tell some of the kids like, hands are we can see them. And it's not like they know that this is a sexual thing, it just feels good, right? Um, 
And so like that isn't going to mean your one sexuality or another because a lot of kids do that. Uh, my favorite media betrayal of this uh, was on the show House. And so he was seeing a young girl in the clinic and her mom was like, I don't know, I think she's having seizures or whatever. Um, and so Hoax is using a lot of euphemisms to try to explain to the mom that the little girl's masturbating. And it's like, she's doing this, she's doing that. She's finding Nemo and the little girl goes, ah! <laughs> right? Like kids are gonna try to figure out what's happening with their bodies and that's okay. And that's not going to mean they're gonna be one orientation or the other. Sexual orientation is influenced by genetics. So again, even though kids are often born to straight parents, it seems like there is some sort of genetic influence given the percentages, probably recessive, right? Uh, some things in the brain as well. So the corpus callosum, again, remember back if you've taken 101, is the part that connects the two hemisphere of the brain. So we have a, a left and right hemisphere and there's a thick band of neurons, basically axons that connect the two. And it seems like somehow that's linked, but also uh, hemispheric symmetry. Uh, hang on just one sec. I'm just, one of these was from my daughter's school. Uh, nope, I knew that already, we're good. Okay, <laughs> just making sure she wasn't sick. Um, and so it seems like the symmetry between the two hemispheres might also differ slightly. Again, just like with any correlation, right? We need to be cautious about interpreting this. Is it that these brain differences are causing people to be queer? Is it that because people are queer, these brain differences develop? You know, we would need to essentially study brain development in utero, right, on to puberty in order to make that determination. So this gets tricky. Prenatal hormones, there might be some difference in that hormone wash that you get. Again, who knows? <laughs> there's some studies suggesting it, but there's also some studies suggesting not. Um, and then we know social factors do tend to come into play here. So some people, because of social factors, will be in denial about their sexuality, right? Or will never act on it. Um, I remember, I think it was called Pray Away. There was a documentary I watched on Netflix about this. Uh, and it was about folks who went through conversion therapy, which by the way, has been largely discredited, not only as not working. So if you're not familiar with conversion therapy, it's the idea that you put someone who's LGBTQ plus in therapy and you're gonna like make them straight or make them their gender assigned at birth. Um, not only does it not work, but it's actually harmful. Like people will essentially get PTSD from going through this. Um, but in this documentary, there was a couple where they were both convinced they were converted and they ended up getting divorced and ending up with same sex partners later in their life. And they were like spokespeople for this conversion therapy movement. So yeah, you, will, you might try to conform because of that, right? But um, you know, maybe not. So important things to note about LGBTQ plus folks, they are very similar to the heterosexual population in terms of their attitudes and their psychological adjustment. The one exception really is that they face more discrimination, they face more stress. And we know anytime you face those things, that's going to negatively affect you psychologically, right? Just like people of different races and ethnicities are negatively affected psychologically by experiencing that discrimination. Um, they, the difference in their heter from heterosexual populations, sometimes we see differences in their hobbies, activities, and occupation. Although, some of that may also be socialized in a different way, right? Like there's this expectation that like men who identify with gay, as gay will be more artistic and women who identify as gay will be like contractors, right? And like some of them, but not all of them, right? Um, and I mentioned the prejudice and discrimination and often coming out can be liberating. But again, if your family is not supportive, if your friends are not supportive, if you get fired from your job for it, which you still can in a lot of states, um, especially if you're right to work states, which basically means anyone could fire you at any time for any reason. Um, 
then obviously that's going to confound that. Alrighty, we're going to start doing some activities and questions related to gender and sex on Wednesday. And if you didn't turn in your exam, make sure you do it before you leave. Have a good day, y'all. Okay, Melissa, hey, what's up? Hi, I'm so sorry. Um, 